decided to come up permanently in 1974. And uh, so I joined the faculty then on a full-time basis. In my case, I was able to teach in three different programs, uh, astronomy, physics, and then uh, English and environmental studies. And in terms of a variety of students, uh, in terms of just the life of the mind, uh, it was an incredible experience. I don't know of any other institution of higher education in the country where I could teach in three different departments that had nothing to do with each other. <laughs> Campus was all temporary buildings. There were no permanent buildings at all. The library wasn't here. We're on top of the library, working the library right now. And they were all temporary buildings and they were all down on the east side of uh, the property, um, including the library. And um, then the, the Brookings Library was finished in 1976, and uh, while it was still in the latter stages of construction, uh, we moved the telescope up here on the roof. The dome was given to us by the city of Springfield, um, and uh, while the building was still under construction, uh, the crane was outside and it moved the dome up here. So uh, that all took place in... Uh, 1976. Uh, we installed the telescope in the fall of 1976 and we had our first star party in January of 1977. It was really cold and we had six people. <laughs> and then I got smart and said no we don't want to do this in the middle of the winter time when it's too cold for people so we started the following fall star parties and uh, right at the first Friday after Labor Day and ran till Thanksgiving and uh, as they became more known in the community and so forth, why the attendance increased until we were averaging uh, in the late 70s and through the 80s and into the 90s, we were averaging about 250 people on a Friday night. There was a partial eclipse of the sun in February of 1977. Uh, it was on a Friday. Uh, District 186 was having teachers' meetings, so all the kids were home and their mothers didn't know what to do with them, so they brought them out here. It was an absolutely gorgeous day absolutely brilliant and we had 4,000 people here for that. Obviously not everybody could see it because the eclipse didn't last that long. Uh, so to accommodate those people who couldn't see it then I, I opened up on Friday noons uh, that spring I opened up the observatory so people could see the sun. On May 10th, 1994, uh, we were in the path of a, it wasn't a total solar eclipse, it's called an annular eclipse. That means the, sun, the moon was a little bit farther away from the Earth in its elliptical orbit around the Earth than it normally is, and uh, it didn't quite cover the surface of the moon, uh, excuse me, the surface of the sun. So the moon would move, moved in front of the sun like this, but there would be a little annulus, that's why they're called annular eclipses, of the sun showing all around it here. And we were only about 500 yards from the center of that uh, annular eclipse. So what we did was put a small television camera on the back end of our 14-inch telescope upstairs. We took the feed from that small television camera and we went over the side of the building and made that feed then available to uh, the national uh, television networks. We had NBC, ABC, CBS, and CNN here all taking the feed and broadcasting that eclipse, that annular eclipse, uh, around the world from right here at our observatory. Let's go immediately to the best picture we have of this eclipse. Ah, uh, there it is. Yep, light on both sides. Now that, that is something. Uh, just a, a short time ago as the, as, uh, the uh, moon just moved into that center position, a great cheer went up here. And I tell you, we've got some interesting people with... I don't know, Tom, can you go ahead Go ahead and see that the, these folks are getting it projected. That's a projected image there. And uh, this is just a perfect time. And we've got people of all ages here looking through all sorts of different means, uh, from the most sophisticated to, well, the most makeshift. That probably was the most the largest event that we had because literally we had millions and millions of viewers for that one. We will be here to bring it to you live. Stay tuned. For now, I'm Jeff Flock, CNN, reporting live from the campus of Sangamon State University here in Springfield, Illinois. Well, I got the bright idea back in 1956 when I was an undergraduate. I worked on a telescope in Vermont, Springfield, Vermont, uh, that had a fixed focal point. It was built, designed and built in 1927. And uh, I thought if we could duplicate that kind of uh, telescope where the, folk, where the eyepiece would be fixed, 
anybody who was using a wheelchair could come up to it. No matter where the telescope was pointing then, uh, they could look at whatever objects they wanted to see. They came out, looked at what we had. Two days later, we had our money <laughs> through, through the Capital Development Board uh, ADA money. And uh, so I called her consultant and said, okay, I've got the money. He couldn't believe it. <laughs> he said, I've got the money. It was only a week later. He said, I've got the money. He said, okay. Nine months later, all these crates showed up in my office and we hauled them up here and we put the telescope together. Uh, I worked with Jack Jensko, who was on our faculty. He's now unfortunately deceased, but he was, he was in a wheelchair. And um, we worked out, you know, various protocols and how we we're going to handle things and so forth. And so we started Sunday night star parties for people with disabilities then. And uh, I think that's opened up to a whole new constituency in the central Illinois area, a whole new constituency opened up the sky to lots of folks who would never, never have the opportunity. And this was the first telescope in the world that's dedicated to people who, uh, with disabilities. And uh, I'm very proud of that. Back in the late 70s, it was obvious that we couldn't do much research on the campus because we're so light impacted from our own lights and from the highway and from Springfield and so forth. So. Um, I went to Alex Lacey, who was president at the time, and asked him uh, if I could investigate building an observatory, a real research observatory, out in the country uh, under dark skies. And uh, he gave me the go-ahead. About that time, Alex left the university, and Derwood Long became president. And I took it to him, and he said, yes, you can do this, but you, have to do, you can't use state funds. You have to go out and raise all the money yourself. Uh, this was in 1985, I believe it was, and uh, I uh, did. I went out and raised the funds for this observatory where we are right now. We opened in 1991 then, and uh, so we're almost 20 years old now. Uh, the instrument that you see behind us here is a 20-inch uh, telescope. This telescope is dedicated to spectroscopy, that is taking the light from a star, dividing it up into its wavelengths. Uh, if you put it, let's, let's give you an example. If you take a, a piece of glass and you put it in sunlight, you'll get a spectrum of colors, okay? Well, we do the, exactly the same thing, a little more sophisticated, obviously, but we do the same thing, except we don't worry about the colors, we just worry about the wavelengths. And I would like to add that uh, the facilities that we have here, this observatory and the one next door, which we'll see in a few moments, uh, plus what we have on the campus, plus the uh, telescope for people with disabilities, give us the finest equipment in the state of Illinois for doing astronomical research and teaching and training. And we're very proud of that. This is a much smaller telescope, a 16-inch telescope, uh, and it uses an entirely different uh, technique to uh, study stars. It's called photometry and what we do is measure one set of wavelengths in the spectrum against another set to see the difference in brightness between those two sets and then a third set. We bring students out here, we show them photometric techniques, how to use a photometer, uh, which is a separate piece of equipment that goes on the end of the telescope here. Show them how to use a spectrograph and uh, these are the two basic analytical techniques that are used to study stars. And what we can do, as I say, is to uh, study the same star with two different techniques at exactly the same time, which gives us very high quality data. I'm not sure about this, but we may be the only observatory complex in the United States doing this kind of work at the same time. Photometry and spectroscopy of the same object at the same time. This observatory was opened in 2004. Uh, the observatory, uh, money for the observatory here came from uh, not only the Barber family, but it also came uh, from when I retired, uh, the university set up a retirement fund uh, in my name and students donated enough money that we could build the observatory, That's nice. which was very nice. I don't mean to brag, but <laughs> uh, I'm very proud of that. I've always said that I would rather teach here than any other place that I know of, and that includes the Ivy League. <laughs> uh, again, because of the maturity of students, uh, I've had students uh, 
coming out of the community colleges and then being a junior here before we had freshmen and sophomores, uh, sitting next to people who had PhDs <laughs> in the same classroom, the same class, the same course. And it was great challenge but also great fun for me to be able to work with uh, those varying levels of educational backgrounds uh, in the course that I was teaching and I, I just uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. One of my colleagues once told me they said uh, they invented Sangamon State for Charlie Schweighauser <laughs> and I think there's a certain amount of truth to the fact that I, I, I couldn't imagine a more rewarding and satisfying career than I've had here at the University, uh, UIS and SSU.